Thank you, Alan, and thank you for inviting me. I hope you were still happy with that decision when I'm done talking. Uh, you tired yet? Oh, but it's one thing that academics love, it's introductions. <laughs> introductions to introductions. Um, so the talk about teaching. The first thing that should probably be said about it is that there's a lot of it. Um, there is a tremendous amount of talk about teaching today. Uh, ten years ago, when I went to graduate school here, ten years and forty pounds ago, um, we spent very little time talking about teaching. Um, today, I don't imagine that there's a, a, a university or community college in the country that doesn't have some sort of center for teaching and learning. Uh, there are more teaching workshops than ever before, um, more forums like this one, more prizes for good teachers, more journals for publishing things about teaching. And outside the universities, in the media and in the halls of legislature, there is even more talk about teaching uh, and what we do is that we do here. Um, we have suddenly become uh, the topic of conversation. Um, everybody in every op-ed page in Canada, the United States, suddenly has a plan to reinvent or transform or reform higher education. Um, one thing there isn't more of these days is actual teachers, which is, of course, the main reason we're suddenly talking so much about teaching. Um, because we're having to get better at it. We're having to do much more than we used to with much less. Uh, Canadian universities spend more money every single year, but we spend less of it every year on teaching. At the same time, we are teaching more students than we ever did before about one and a half times more students than we did 10 years ago. We are talking about teaching now more and more because teaching new kinds of students, students who not so long ago would never have even considered going to university, requires new methods and new skills. And because teaching students in larger classes than we've ever had before requires new methods and new skills. That's why we're talking about teaching. There is another set of numbers in behind the sudden interest in teaching, and that's dollars and jobs, um, too few of both. When university graduates more or less uh, fell into good jobs, governments left us, by and large, alone. They had other things to do, you know, wars and things like that. And we seem to be doing OK, and they didn't really understand what it was that we're doing anyway. When university uh, particular governments would sometimes get involved by taking money away from one thing or giving money to another thing, whatever an election seemed to need in that particular year. But by and large, governments in both Canada and the United States have left us alone to teach what and how we want. That's never been true of public education. Governments have always told public school teachers what and how to teach, but not us. They have left us alone. That is changing. It is changing fast. And it is changing for economic reasons. It started in Europe. With globalization, economic integration, and increased academic and professional mobility, there is a growing need for the recognition of qualifications outside the country which awards them. The borderless delivery of higher education has made cross-border quality assurance increasingly important. Uh, that's from a progress report um, to the European Council and Parliament on the Bologna process. Um, the plan to create what is essentially a kind of free trade zone for higher education in Europe. Uh, not because it's necessarily better for students, any more than free trade in North America has necessarily been better for consumers because it's better for employers. Easier for corporations to uh, move people around like products, their minds. 
buy their labor low and sell it high in whatever country needs at the moment. It has been somewhat controversial. Canada does not have the problem that the main problem that the Bologna process was created to address. Uh, Post-secondary education, particularly in the undergraduate programs, is by and large equal in all regions of Canada and all provinces. And each province recognizes degrees from the other provinces. But Canadian governments have nonetheless enthusiastically embraced the spirit and a great deal of the letter of the reforms coming out of the Bologna process out of Europe. The latest and loudest is a discussion paper released this summer from the Ontario Ministry for Training Colleges and Universities. Um, this, points, this document points explicitly to the Bologna process as its model and as its inspiration for massive reforms to post-secondary education in Ontario, in both community colleges and the universities, including labor market focused three-year degrees, uh, standardized learning outcomes to, quote, promote mobility credit transfer and credential recognition, end quote. The proposal to move up to 60% of academic undergraduate courses online in order to create both space and budget for more entrepreneurial education in our classrooms. So far, there have not been any marches in Ontario like we saw in Bologna, um, partly because the government released the paper, uh, I think on Canada Day, middle of the summer when the students were elsewhere, and then set a deadline on feedback of September 30th. So it was a challenge for everybody to read this thing, much less respond in time. But opposition to the paper has been stunningly unanimous and unequivocal from all sectors of at least my university and I assume the others in Ontario, from the president, the faculty association, and the student union. Nationally, the Canadian Association of University Teachers called this paper the most serious attack on post-secondary education of which we are aware in Canada. If this is allowed to happen in Ontario, it will become government policy in other provinces. Canadian and American governments have uh, got behind the Bologna process not because we share the same problems as, as European universities do. Um, we don't. Uh, but they are getting behind it because it has given them an opportunity to ask their own questions of universities, a question that is relevant here and now, deeply relevant here and now. And the question is simply this, that we are increasingly hearing from the legislature. Just what exactly is it that you folks do with the billions of dollars that we give you every year? That's the question they're asking. That's the real question. Um, like I said, nobody cared too much about what we did when our students fell into good jobs and ended up paying taxes. But today, our graduates enter an economy that is fighting over the last remaining scraps of the public pie and a job market about which the best one Canadian economist could say is that, well, at least it's not as bad as Greece. Those are a couple of reasons why we're suddenly talking about teaching today. One of the, the hard lessons of the global recession, if we listen closely, is that there is no necessary correlation between a university degree and a job. There never really was, but now it's obvious. And so as governments scramble to make up the deficits that we've created, they are asking hard questions of universities and about how well we're doing what we do. The questions they're asking about quality assurance and teaching effectiveness, I don't believe those are the real questions because I don't believe those are real problems. The questions are smoke screens for real questions and real problems. And those questions are about accountability and productivity, not the student's productivity, our productivity. 